Right, we got that going. Got the PowerPoint up, the right PowerPoint this time. So um, today we will be talking about small blind versus big blind tournament play. Uh, that is the topic for today. Uh, it's going to be mostly a pre-flop video. I will have some discussion about how to play flops. But I figure in these short amount of times when we only have about 30 minutes of content, um, pre-flop is the easiest and quickest way to shore up some leaks. And uh, as I've said before in the past, um, getting a solid pre-flop fundamental studying of in knowledge of a situation is what's going to help you set up yourself for better flop play, better turn play. So if you have a problem, like you realize, oh, I don't have any strong hands on the turn or I'm overfolding turns or rivers, it's most likely because you're screwing up on the flop or pre-flop earlier on. And that's where your mistake comes in is earlier streets, not the current street that you're on. So today's webinar came from a student I asked on Twitter um, just how I'm unsure how to play pre-flop when it is folded to me in the small blind uh, should I be raising should I be limping how do I construct ranges when it is folded to me in the small blind what adjustments do I make on different stack sizes and as always all examples will assume a one big blind ante um, can someone else confirm the audio is working? I confirmed earlier and it seemed like it was working. All right, I think that it is a problem with your own audio uh, correct procurement. Um, seems like everyone else is having, be good with the audio. Perfect guys, I got it. Um, so uh, as always, all these examples are going to assume a one big blind ante because we play 95% of the tournament with antes. So I'm not going to bother looking at the non ante stuff. Um, non antes, you're going to be obviously playing much tighter. Uh, and so you can kind of make your own adjustments from there. And we'll be focusing a lot on the small blind play. And we'll talk a little bit about big blind, but that's a whole other topic. So... First things first, when you're in the small blind, you're in the worst position at the table. Um, the big blind isn't the worst position. The small blind is the worst position. You're forced to put money into the pot. Only a half a big blind compared to one big blind. And the big blind, but you're now out of position to everyone at the table. And when you call and play a hand, you're giving a really good price to the big blind. So you're most likely playing multi-way pots out of position to multiple people. So... It is the worst position at the table. Playing wide ranges at a very large SPR is very difficult. SPR, again, from our previous one, is stack to pot ratio. And the wider the ranges are, the larger the SPR is, the more the big blind gets to screw with you. And it's fun when you're the big blind, and it sucks when you're the small blind because you get, a, get punished, and if you're the big blind, you get to do the punishing. So... Um, Optimal strategies um, change dependent on a few variables. The most important two that we'll focus on is one, who is the big blind? And two, how deep stacked or shallow stacked are we? So those are the two most important variables. Uh, if you watch my shows in the past, I kind of give you baseline strategies and then we adjust it based on the variables. So keep that in mind. Let's look at the first one. Who is the big blind? Uh, this is the most important piece of information that you're going to have that will help determine what your strategy should be. And your strategy really is going to be different versus every single big blind player. Um, do they fold too, many, too much to raises? Do they call optimally? These are the first questions you should be asking yourself. How aggressive post-flop are they? Will they put you in tough situations? And how well do they, to go along with that, how well do they play against continuation bets? Do they overfold or underfold? So each of these questions that we're asking is going to lead to a exploitable adjustment that we're going to make from our baseline ranges. So do they fold too many, too much to raises or do they call optimally? Well, if they're, they're not defending their big blind enough, we're going to raise more and steal their big blind more. Or if they over call, um, well, if they over call, um, if they call too many hands from the big blind, it's kind of the same exploit as if they fold too much. They're just going to have a weaker range post-flop, and now you get to exploit them post-flop. 
Uh, so knowing how what type of ranges they defend from their big blind is very important. Uh, we've talked about that in past webinars. How aggressive do they play post flop? This is really important. Um, the more aggressive they are post flop and the tougher, you know, I told you that the big blind really gets to abuse the small blind in these blind versus blind situations. So how much they take advantage of that will determine your the type of strategy you want to use from the small blind. So if they're putting you in tough situations, you know, you're going to have to probably stick to these baseline strategies more. And if they aren't putting you in any tough situations, if they play very fit or fold, you can really get creative and really just try to exploit and play a lot of pots from the small blind if they're not going to be putting the, those in the, the right situations. Um, how well do they play against continuation bets? Obviously, the two most frequent actions we're going to have here is we're either going to be limping or raising from the small blind and then seeing a flop. And how they play against continuation bets will have a big factor on our win rate from the small blind. If they're overfolding, underfolding, how often they raise your continuation bets. Basically, how tough are they making your life? So these, all these questions are kind of um, connected, and this is why the type of questions you want to be asking about the, the big blind to determine how much you want to adjust your strategy from our baseline. Um, stack sizes. When we're playing 100 big blinds or deeper um, with an ante, our standard strategy is going to be no raising, and we're going to be limping about... 90 to 93 percent of hands basically you're limping all your hands except you're folding like seven deuce off nine deuce off deuce five off basically the really bad offsuit hands are what we're going to be folding um, and you'll see that later in the ranges we're going to be doing no raising and then we're going to have a linear limp re-raising range and when you're playing 100 big blinds deep with an ante you're getting a great price so you're in the small blind, there's one and a half big blinds in the pot from the blinds plus the ante. So there's two and a half, you're getting five to one on your money. You have to call a half a big blind to win two and a half big blinds. So you're getting a really good price. So you wanna be playing m most of your hands. And in order to kind of protect our range and protect the big blind abusing us, we're gonna be limping some strong hands. And then when we get ISO'd, then we're gonna kind of hit them with this linear limp re-raising range and we're going to protect ourselves at this high SPR and also limp re-raising this range is going to lower the SPR post flop and reduce our post flop edge against these opponents. Um, at 50 big blinds or less, we're gonna have a raising range now because the SPR is going to be low, lower. Um, as we talked about in prior webinars, uh, now the SPR is lower, so our offsuit broadways and hands that can make good top pairs um, go up a ton in value and the out of position disadvantage is negated because of that lower SPR. Uh, Craig Collins, what is SPR? SPR is stack to pot ratio, which we talked about in one of the previous webinars. You can go ahead and watch the replay of that on YouTube. Um, go to the poker coaching channel and you should be able to find the replay of that so here's kind of the first range we're going to look at and this range is a linear limp re-raising range of what we're going to have deep stacked uh, against a good opponent so this is kind of our baseline strategy here um, as I said before you know I have us folding about 12% 13 so about 88% of hands but Basically, all you need to know here is like these white hands uh, are the hands that um, we will be folding. So these 10 deuce offs, a lot of these weak offsuit deuces and offsuit threes. Um, these are the types of hands that we're going to be folding. All these hands are going to be limped. The red ones are going to be our limp re-raises. The blues are the limp folds, and the green are the limp calls. So as you can see, we're playing a ton of hands. Um, the main reason is we don't want to inflate the pot and put us, we don't want to, we want to, we're getting such a good price pre-flop that we're going to protect our range. And in order to play all these hands, we want to be limping our stronger hands as well. So we're limping kind of the top 90% of hands. And as we talked about in the linear and polar 
webinar. Um, Steve, you asked about the term linear. You can go back and watch the linear polar webinar that I did earlier this month. So we're going to be doing a linear limp re-raising range of around like 12%-ish of hands. And it's basically like nines plus, um, ace jack plus, all the suited broadways and suited connectors, and some of these suited one gappers. Um, all these hands play it very well at deep stacks. And this is kind of going to be our linear limp re-raising range. Um, say you limp the small big blind ISOs to three and a half big blinds. We're going to be looking at somewhere of around a four to four and a half times the, the raise uh, limp re-raise. Uh, we're doing lots of limp calling with this green. As you can see, all different types of hands. we got some offsuit aces, all these suited aces. We got all of the smaller pocket pairs, suited kings. Basically, the only hands we're going to be folding are these junkier offsuit high-low hands like king five, queen five, queen four. Those are going to be our limp folds. Um, and this is a big part here, and this is why we're going to be making a lot of – there's – a few, only a few situations you're going to be playing a strategy kind of like this because this assumption is based off of your opponent is isoing from the big blind of around 40%. And most players are not doing that. They're not isoing wide enough. But again, like I said, this is our base strategy of what we kind of want to be doing um, against, you know, a good opponent and now i'm actually going to skip a slide so let's look at um this one so this is kind of a big blind response at a optimal kind of level of what you want to be doing against a small blind limp at 100 big blinds uh, a couple of people asked what isoing is it's just raising over a limp so you limp you just call the small blind and the big blind raises to four big blinds so in theory here, when you're in the big blind, you kind of want to be raising versus a limp about 40%. And as you can see, when we go through these, uh, um, and these are all tournament situations. When we look at this um, range, I want the main reason I have this range up in this slide is I want people to realize how like tight most people are ISO raising from the big blind and how they really just check back way too often against this small blind limp. So um, if we look up the uh, the raising range here in the red, this is kind of like a pretty standard range, which I think would be like 27%, especially once we take out these crappier suitor hands and stuff. You know, sevens plus just kind of this value range is really only going to be about 20% of hands. So I feel like the your average opponent that you're going to be seeing um, from the big blind is probably only going to be isoing somewhere around 20% of the time versus the limp. And the example I kind of wanted to point out here is these blue hands. And to get to that like 40% number that this big blind probably should be isoing, there's a lot of hands here that they need to be raising like 25% of the time. I'm not saying that you want to raise king four offsuit um, every single time, but there's just so many hands they need to be isoing in terms to be the small blind to make limping 100% not um, optimal. Let me go back here. I don't know if I'm explaining that fully the best that I want to. We have this range against the good opponents. I want to look more so this range now is what a lot of you are probably going to be used to. And this is kind of, I wanted to show that base range of the linear limp. Um, I wanted to show that linear limp re-raising range. And now we're going to kind of look at this small blind play versus a weak opponent. So this is the average probably range that you're going to want to be using. And it's quite different now. Um, because the big blind is not going to be ISO raising enough against our limps, we don't really have as much incentive to be trapping with our big hands. So the two differences in these ranges is that here in this range, we're going to be limp re-raising a ton because we're assuming that the big blind is going to be raising a lot. 
So against a very aggressive big blind player that's going to raise your limp a lot, this is the type of range you want to do. And in this range, you're limping all these hands versus against a weak opponent who's not going to be raising your limps wide enough. We want to be doing this, and we're going to be doing a lot less limping. We're raising all the hands in red to about three and a half to four times the big blind. And it's basically a linear raising range. We're raising the top. 24% of hands here in this range that I have. So basically all pairs, suited connectors, suited one gappers, and all are like suited eights are better and ace nine off are better. In the red, the green are all gonna be limps. So we're limping a variety of a lot of suited stuff um, and like big card, high lows type of stuff. We're still not folding much. We're still folding that bottom 10% of kind of crappy hands preflop and then these blue hands are gonna be the hands that we limp fold against the limps, and the green hands are gonna be hands that we limp call against the um, weaker opponent. You're still playing about 90% of hands. Um, one note here, exploit that's kind of cool. I saw Jonathan post a poll on this that a lot of people got wrong. So if your opponent is folding over 50% of the time when you raise from the small blind, you can raise with any two cards to three times the big blind. So it folds to you in the small blind. You have to put in two and a half big blinds to make it three times the big blind to raise. And you're risking two and a half to win the two and a half big blinds in the pot. So when you put in two and a half to win, two and a half has to work 50% of the time. And if your opponent doesn't defend the top 50% of their hands, you instantly make money. And you're making money because even when they call, say they call exactly 50% of the time, you're still going to win the pot with your Jack-5 offsuit, you know, 20% of the time when they do call. So paying attention against these really tight opponents, you can even expand this red range even way more and start raising a ton of hands in the small blind if they're playing way too tight. You can, And in some cases, you might even want to be raising 100% of hands because your opponent is not going, you're going to be instantly making money because they fold too much. Um, and one more exploit I want to talk about that I see from a lot of players that is not correct is people love to limp like aces in the small blind as like their hand to trap with. And it's actually, I don't think that is correct. You don't want to be trap limping with aces in the small blind because the most common hands that your opponents are going to be raising and trying to steal your blind with is your hands like your suited aces and their ace x. If your opponent's too tight, those are the first hands they're going to go to to isolate you when you limp. And so by limping aces, when you have two aces, you're, they're automatically not going to be raising enough because you have two of the aces in your hands. So it'd be better to, to trap with a hand like pocket kings or pocket queens because then you don't have an ace. It's more likely the big blind has an ace in their hand and they're going to raise more often and you're going to be able to um, get that limp raise in more. So two things to note here. One, if your opponents are folding way too much, it can be profitable to even raise with any two cards from the small blind. And two, don't limp trap with aces because you block the range that you want them to be raising you with. And so... Here, we're making it like 4x on the small blind with this wide linear range, and then we have this weaker limping range versus against a good opponent. We're going to be limping everything and doing a linear limp re-raise against them. So this all depends on how often the big blind is going to be um, raising against your limp. Um, now we're going to look a little bit at the, uh, shallow stack play versus good opponents. So this is at like 40 big blinds. And again, this is against good opponents. So this is kind of our baseline strategy. And this baseline strategy here is, so now the, we're playing at a lower S SPR because the, uh, there's not stacks aren't as deep. So we're a lot happier to raise more hands and, Play more pots post flop. Um, the types of hands we want to raise are we're going to be playing these. A lot of these offsuit Broadway hands now are going to become raises. A lot of these suited Broadways. 
Um, all these red hands basically are becoming raises and the limp calling range is still kind of similar. A lot of the suited stuff, high, low, you know, a six off, a seven off, king seven off. And we're going to be limp folding a decent amount. But the one thing I want to note here is that we have a few more limp traps. Now we're kind of mixing in. Um, we're, we're going to be limp trapping some of these big suited aces, big off suit aces, and some of our middle lane pocket pairs. So what I was talking about before, now we're going to be limping hands like queens through eights, but we're going to be raising kings and aces um, for that same reason that I'd rather limp trap with pocket jacks or pocket queens because then we allow our opponent to have ace five offsuit, raise it up with the ace five offsuit, and then we get to put in the limp raise with queens or jacks or tens, these middling pairs to limp raise and then get all the money in for 40 big blinds. Um, if you're playing against an opponent that is not going to be raising enough from the big blind, all these green hands up here all become raises now. We're not going to be having any limp traps against an opponent that plays way too tight. Um, we're just, we don't really need to protect our range against them. So we just go back to this against the 40 big blind play becomes basically this range again. It's almost the same as the, um, the 40 big blind range against a weak opponent basically becomes similar to the hundred big blind range from the, um, this against the weak opponent. So. In general, the, the mistakes that I see from people is, one, they don't raise enough from the small blind against weak opponents. That's the, probably the number one mistake people are making is they, they limp too many hands and don't raise enough against w very weak opponents. And they try to trap against weak opponents way too often. And those opponents just aren't raising enough to... Uh, I just got a message. My audio was lost. The people can still hear the audio. Can anyone hear the audio still? Okay. Now is the audio working? I don't know what happened there. All right, good. Audio is back. I don't know what happened there. Okay, so what I was talking about, I'll go back a second. Um, the number one mistake that players are making from the small blind is that they are not raising enough from the small blind and they try to trap too much. So these hands like king, queen off, king, queen suited, pocket aces, ace-queen, ace-king. Players are limping those hands too much and not getting value from those hands, whether they're deep stacked or shallow stacked against weak opponents. And against most opponents, you just want that are like weaker players that aren't going to put you in tough spots. You just want to be taking this, you know, raising like the top 20 to 25% of hands, taking these pocket pairs, suited connectors, raising it up to four times the big blind and forcing your opponent to make a mistake either in that they're not going to defend enough or now you're getting value out of those bigger hands. And I think that's the correct play. And then limping this green range here, um, that's going to be your biggest exploit probably against a lot of the opponents that you guys are going to be playing against is raising up all this red range, limping the green, and not worry about balance or anything like that. Being balanced doesn't matter much against these weak opponents. I show you the ranges you want to play against good opponents because I think you need to know that baseline in order to be able to make understand the adjustments and just realizing that no one really is raising enough hands. This range here being the big blind response to the small blind limp, uh, this range here is like 36% of hands. And so this is what I'm trying to get at here. If I'm playing in the big blind, I need to be raising all of these red hands plus like 25% of the time I need to be raising up these hands like queen six off, queen five off, king five off, jack four suited, jack three suited, jack two suited. Like all these hands I need to be raising and no one is raising those hands enough. And so this is kind of another counter exploit is when you're the big blind 
playing against small blinds that limp. People in the big blind do not ISO raise enough. Um, um, someone, and I, I should probably po uh, point this out, that these are all situations where it's a heads up pot now between the small blind and the big blind. And so the other exploit being when you're in the big blind facing when the small blind, it folds to the small blind and they limp in is that people are not ISO raising enough to three and a half, four times the big blind against a small blind limp. And these are the types of hands you need to be raising uh, to punish that small blind to make sure they're not getting to play. You don't want them to play all those 90% of hands. Um, you're going to, there's a lot of money. They're limping in with 90% of hands. They're going to be doing a lot of limp folding and you should be punishing them with raises to steal those limps. And we're doing it with a lot of these lower suited cards, obviously all our strong value hands, but these blue hands, this is kind of where you want to be start mixing it in. And um, the reason some of these hands like King Deuce offsuit, or even like a hand, like let's take a hand like uh, six, three offsuit, why it's a good hand to raise up against a small blind limp. And the reason like a hand like six, three offsuit um, is a good hand to raise sometimes. Uh, I have it in here as like 25% of the time. Um, the reason six, three offsuit can be a good hand to raise is because when you raise it up, let's look at that range that is folding against your uh, limp. So this is the range that we were going to play as the small blind. When we raise six, three offsuit, now they're folding king six offsuit, queen six offsuit, jack six offsuit, 10, six, nine, six. And then now they're folding hands like ace three, king three, queen three. So we get all those hands that are, you know, six, three is obviously a really poor hand and doesn't have much equity and doesn't play well post flop. But now we get all these hands to fold that had us dominated post flop. So when we do raise and they call, our outs are normally more live. We're less likely to be dominated with the 6-3 offsuit. And a lot of the time, they're just going to be folding when we raise it up. So that's why these kind of high-low hands, like 10-3 off, we get them to fold hands like that ace-3, three, king-3 three are going to fold when we raise. And then they're also going to fold hands like 10-6 offsuit, 10-5 offsuit, and 10-4 offsuit. So the adjustment here, the exploit that I think a lot of players are not making is they don't raise enough from the big blind when the small blind limps into the pot um, pretty much at all stack depths. So that's the adjustment that you kind of want to be making from the big blind uh, versus a small blind limp. So we've kind of looked at a couple of different um, exploits you could be making versus players when you're playing in the small blind, um, knowing how often your player is raising from the big blind and that kind of determines what your strategy is from the small blind in terms of what hands you want to limp and what hands you want to raise. And um, also from the big blind, pretty much across the board, a lot of people are not raising enough in the big blind. And I hope this range here kind of... Uh, Audio is good now. I don't know what is going on with it right now. I know there's a lot of people just posting it. All right. Sorry about that, everyone. So the um, main the main exploits here from the big blind is that people are not raising enough against small blind limps. So the... Uh, Trying so for what you guys should be taking out of this webinar is making sure you're raising enough from the big blind when it folds to the small blind and they limp into the pot, and also learning how to identify who the opponent is in the big blind and knowing how aggressive they're going to isolate your limps. And against the very aggressive players, you want to be playing a more limping everything strategy and then be limp re raising more. And Keep in mind when I say limp rears and more, that doesn't mean just with like ace king and jacks are better. You're going to be doing it with some suited connectors, your suited broadways, you know, hands like queen 10 suited. Um, and against the weaker players that are not 
isolated enough, you're going to be playing more, doing a lot more raising than most people do, about 25% of hands. And that is um, probably a lot less hands than most people are raising currently or are not. And I know this blind versus blind play stuff is can get pretty complicated. It's a very tough situation, like I said early on, because stacks are very large and you have are forced to play a lot of hands from the big blind and the small blind. It is one of the toughest positions to play in poker in one of the toughest situations to play in poker. And so kind of taking a look at these ranges, studying them, seeing what the difference are, seeing where you're too tight or too loose is really important to learning how to improve your win rate from either of the positions in the blinds and just kind of increasing your overall ROI in tournaments because blind play is just really important. And I think it's one of the areas where you can exploit people the most. Um, take a couple minutes here to talk about post flop stuff. Um, like I said, it's kind of a completely different topic, so we're not going to go into it too much, but the basics. So, when we're playing a hundred big blinds, um, we're going to talk about this against like kind of a good opponent. When we're playing a hundred big blinds, we're limping all these hands. We have a hundred percent of hands and let's say it goes limp and then the person checks. If they check, we can kind of remove, like no one's really checking back these Broadway hands like King Queen off, King Jack off, all these Broadway hands. So at a lot of it, so a deep stack when it goes limp and check behind any hands with like two Broadway cards on the board or even one Broadway card, um, we can almost bet at a very, very high frequency. Um, but when the low cards come on the boards, like these five, four threes or seven, five deuce, when there's no Broadway cards, um, those other cards are more likely to hit the big blind because they didn't raise preflop. Now, um, it's kind of the opposite. Now, when we get back to the 40 big blinds. When we play shallow stack, now we're raising up all these Broadway hands. So at 40 big blinds, look at the types of hands we're raising. King 10 or better. A lot of these suited Broadway hands. So when it limps, if we limp into the small blind and it goes, if we check, now we don't have as many of the Broadway hands in our range because uh, we raise those hands preflop. And so the actually the lower boards become a little bit better for us because we have a lot of the lower hands in our range now versus when we raise, we want to see the Broadway cards on the board. Those are going to be our best boards to continuation bet. Um, and in general, in, in these situations, blind versus blind, uh, these ranges are super wide for both the small blind and the big blind. Um, you can be playing doing a lot of checking out of position and don't be afraid. Don't be feel committed to like have to continuation bet every single pot would be my biggest advice when you're playing from the small blind and you raise, um, don't feel that you have to continuation of every pot. Um, you have a lot of really poor hands in your range and you can be doing a decent amount of checking, check calling, check raising. There's other ways that you can get around, playing post flop without just con blindly continuation betting every flop. And that comes back to our, you know, who is the big blind? The first question we ask and how they react to the, the, how do they react to continuation bets? How do they react to, you know, pre flop ranges and just learning, looking at these boards. It's, you know, if you look at these ranges, you start to learn what kind of flops are good for me to bet. What kind of flops should I be checking? And, just figuring out how your range interacts with the board is the most important part. Um, that's going to kind of wrap up the point of it. Again, I know this is kind of a complicated topic, so there's going to be some questions. So I will get into questions in a minute or two. Um, again, obviously, with poker coaching, if you're on a free trial right now, I uh, highly recommend that you guys take a look at us sign up for the subscription um, right now with the three-year subscription the for poker coaching Jonathan's adding in a ton of his materials 
video is pre-recorded. You're getting access to hundreds of hours of his uh, um, like past coaching sessions and all his webinars that he's done. The main thing on poker coaching that you're going to find are the interactive quizzes. If you haven't signed up yet, uh, these quizzes, as you can see on the right up here, um, basically I'm going to walk you through hands, pause it at the decision points and you get to, um, you get to make, you know, your decision on what's the best, like checking, betting, and you get scored on it. So you can see, and then afterwards you're going to get an explanation of why each decision was chosen and why the score was chosen for that. Um, Four new hand quizzes a week. You get to attend a live coaching challenge webinar with Jonathan every month. Basically on that, Jonathan's going to give you homework and he's going to review the answers to that homework online with you doing a webinar. And also right now, Poker Coaching is giving away three $500 seats to the Big 50 event at this year's World Series. The Big 50 event has a $5 million guaranteed and a first place payout of a million dollars. So you can enter this contest at pokercoaching.com slash WSOP. And the deadline to enter is in about a week on April 30th. Um, so visit pokercoaching.com slash WSOP and go ahead and enter the contest. If you like free money, we're giving away three of the $500 seats. So take a look at that and Enter the contest for your chance to win one of those three seats. And finally, Jonathan has released his new training bundle to help you guys prepare for the World Series. And it's the ultimate WSOP bundle and has over 40 hours of training in it. Uh, so in November, in the Party Poker Online Millions event, a small stakes player named Blaz turned $5 into $1.3 million by taking third place in this $5,300 millions event. He was recently interviewed on the Joe Ingram podcast when he was asked what he did to study for this event. He won a satellite for $5. He said he learned a lot from watching Jonathan Little's webinars and training videos. So what Jonathan did was reached out to Blaz to congratulate him and find out what he had a plan. And Blaz said he was going to be going to the World Series of Poker this summer. So Jonathan ended up reviewing Blaz's. So Jonathan coached him to help him prepare for this World Series and turn the coaching sessions into a new course, which is what this World Series package is uh, based around. So Jonathan reviewed several hand histories for Blaz, including that third place finish where he won 1.3 million. And this brand new course contains over 13 hours of training. So what you get in this course is you're going to get Jonathan's WSOP preparation sessions, which are worth $299. You're going to get Jonathan's WSOP coaching videos worth $297. You're going to get Jonathan's complete guide to single table satellites. You're going to get Jonathan's course he taught at the World Series called Chipping Out Without Chipping Up Without Risking Going Broke. You're going to get his Building a Big Stack Deep in Tournaments. You're going to get main event prep, his live seminar that he did. And you're going to get a live se seminar that mindset coach Elliot Rowe taught called Poker Mindset. So you're going to, you will be getting, you're also going to get Jonathan's WSOP review webinars from 2013, 14, and 15. So the total value of this is $1,231. Uh, and he's doing this package for the World Series for $99 with coupon code WSOP. So if you're interested in getting preparation for the WSOP, you're getting 13 hours of coaching content from Jonathan for $99. So that works out to like $5 an hour. No, a little more than that, like $6 an hour basically. And, uh, you know, $6 an hour to improve your poker game before the World Series is a pretty good deal. So you can get you can get, take a look at this for pokercoaching.com slash WSOP bundle. And now we're going to jump into some questions. Um, let me do this really quick. All right. Now we're going to go into questions on the webinar. I'm sure there will be quite a few because it's a complicated uh, topic.
So Miguel asks adjustments for how deep you are in the tournament. For example, sometimes everybody is less than 30 big blinds after level 15. As stacks get shallower, that's where we're going to be using the um, more of a this range uh, with some more limp traps. This is kind of going to be a shallower stacked range. I have this for 40 big blinds. Um, and again, when players don't raise enough in the big blind, you want to have less traps. You're, you're, you don't really are concerned with trapping here from the big blind. So a lot of times you're still just going to be raising this kind of linear range against tight players, even with the, the 30 big blinds. And once you get less than 15 big blinds, that's when you want to want to start incorporating shoves. Um, we didn't get into shoving today from the small blind, but that's a whole nother topic. Uh, Rahul asks, can I ask why ace deuce and ace three are being limp folded, but not ace four through ace eight? Thanks and appreciate all your webinars. So I think appreciate it. Um, ace three and ace four are just ace deuce and ace three are just a lot of these hands are going to be really borderline hands. And the ace deuce and the ace three are just these weak offsuit aces just don't play very well. And obviously you can make a straight with the ace deuce and ace three. Um, but I think being able to make stronger pairs, um, it depends on stack sizes. If I'm deeper stacked, sometimes the ace six is gonna be uh, is gonna be a worse hand than the ace three. But when I'm shallower stacked, um, the ace six is gonna be a better hand than the ace three. But in general, um, people don't kind of limp fold these hands and kind of always limp call because oh I have an ace. But against most players in the small blind, I you can just get away with limp folding a lot of these weak aces. So what uh, Douglas asks, what do you do if you raise raise small blind from the big blind? The small blind re-raises your raise after he limps. So Douglas is asking about. Um, so you limped in, small blind limped in. We raise this range and we get limp re-raise. Um, pretty like simple answer. We're gonna be wanting just to call with our best hands here. We're obviously gonna be folding all the blue hands. Um, here, assuming we raise a range like this from the big blind versus a small blind limp, we're going to be raising a lot of this, folding a lot of this blue stuff. And then the red stuff, we're going to be, you know, folding the weakest stuff of it. A lot of these smaller, weaker ones and just calling kind of with the best hands that we raise with. Um, and obviously with like, maybe like jacks are better. Queens are better. Jacks and Queens and ace King. That's where we start putting in another raise and trying to get all the money in. Uh, Chuck, could you comment more on the amount to raise? If we're raising from the small blind, I think we want to be making it at least three and a half. I, if you're deep stacked, I would say four times the big blind. When you get shallower stacked, I would say more, a full three X is enough. And if you're in the big blind, raising against a small blind limp, I would say four times the big blind as well. Uh, what limp re-raise sizes do I tend to use from the small blind at 100? So at 100 big blinds, when I limp from the small blind, the big blind makes it four times the big blind. I'm probably going to make it around 15 times the big blind. So a little around four times his raise size. And at four, 40 big blinds deep, if I limp from the small blind and the big blind makes it, let's say, three big blinds, I'm probably going to make it around 10 or 11 big blinds. So a little bit under 40 big blinds or a little bit under four times the big blind, four times the raise. Cedric asks, do we make any adjustments at the final table where ICM is a big factor? Yes, um, at the final table, you definitely want to be playing tighter. Well, it depends. If you're one of the big stacks at the final table, then obviously you want to be raising a lot more because you want to be putting pressure on the smaller stacks. If you're one of the middle stacks or shorter stacks, you're probably going to want to be doing a lot of limping because you're trying to play smaller pots because of the ICM factors at a final table. Uh, Daryl asks, how should we adjust for, say, two to three limps to us in the small blind? Um, 
yeah, this is mostly blind versus blind in the webinar, but we're going to be raising pretty tight from the small blind when there's two to, a couple limps in front of us. I would probably just raise up like uh, this range. So if there's like two to three limps in front of us, I think raising a range is kind of like this. Uh, like pocket nines are better, suited connectors, and these suited broadways. I'd probably limp a range like that against people that limp from earlier position. Uh, Craig asks ICM. ICM is the independent chip model. It has to deal with final table play because now every person that gets knocked out, you get more money and so you're encouraged to play tighter if you're a smaller stack or if you're a bigger stack you get to play a lot more aggressive um are there any other questions that anyone has i have a few more minutes if there's more questions so bob asks how would antis come into play for example smaller antis as opposed to bigger antis as a percentage of the blinds um, it's a good question. I feel like it's kind of been standardized at one big blind ante now in the uh, most tournaments. So that's kind of what I study is the one big blind ante spot. Um, if the ante is bigger, obviously you're encouraged to play a lot more aggressive because there's more money in the pot. And if the ante is smaller, you're, uh, you're encouraged to fold more hands pre-flop. So and not play as aggressive because there's less money to steal. So for example, uh, these are not ranges I would play in cash games because in most cash games, there's no antis. And so in a cash game, basically I'm playing pretty much a raise only. I'm going to be either folding or raising a lot of hands because there's no ante and I'm not really incentivized to limp into the pot because I'm getting a really good price. Cedric, uh, what adjustments do we make versus Maniacs? So I guess the Maniacs, you know, we're pretty much going to be playing this limp everything strategy and then hitting them with a limp re-raise when they raise us in the small blind. And then depending on how maniacal they are, you just widen your limp re-raising range. So you start limp re-raising eights and sevens and ace nine suited. So just the wider and more crazy they get, the wider you can limp re-raise. Uh, Douglas asks, what do you do, Matt, to prepare for the World Series events? Um, it's a good question. Basically, right now, we have about 40 days until the World Series starts. And pretty much everything I'm doing right now is preparing for the World Series. Um, not traveling much. I only have one more trip going to Choctaw. And I'm playing a lot online. Pretty much every day I'm playing online poker to get in a lot of hands and a lot a, a lot of uh, repetition and then I'm doing a lot of studying and reviewing off the table so I'm reviewing my play studying different situations that I know I'm going to encounter in the World Series and um, basically just everything I'm doing right now is for preparing for the World Series um, in about 40 days. Um, uh, I don't want to, Craig, I don't, I'm not going to give out any sites to gamble on in the U S if you do your own research, you can find some, but I'm, I don't want to put my name with any of the sites because a lot of them, you, the only one that I really, that I play on all the time is WSOP.com because I live in Nevada and we can play legally and it's a regulated site. Um, but that's only really an option if you live in New Jersey or Nevada and now in starting in July in Pennsylvania, hopefully. So um, I do a lot of my play on WSOP.com. And yeah, I'll be playing the big 50 and the Colossus. I'll pretty much be playing all the big buy and all the big field WSOP events. Um, kind of went over my schedule already for the World Series. So getting pretty excited for that. Um, there's no more questions, though. We'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, So Simon asked a good question. Does this strategy work with micro stakes? So when you're playing at micro stakes, um, 
yes, you want to be using a strategy like this. So you want to be raising with your top like 25% of hands, all these red hands, and you're going to be limping all the green hands and blue hands, and then just limp folding the blue hands when the opponent raises. So that's kind of your strategy for micro stakes. Is you're, that you're using the weak opponent strategy. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, I will send out the dates for next month's webinars on my Twitter. Um, if you have any topic suggestions for any of the webinars or the articles I'm writing, uh, feel free to tweet them at me. It's McMato Poker, M-C-M-A-T-T-O, P-O-K-E-R on Twitter. And you can tweet on me just saying that you have what topics that you want discussed in the next webinar uh, for May. So I'll talk to you guys later.